Hi, everyone. Isn't it exciting to see the trailer? <laughs> I've seen it like seven million times and I always get like, oh my God. So that's uh, a book based on a movie, based on a person who's sitting here, Cheryl Strait. And I would just, uh, on behalf of Oregon Humanities and everybody here, would like to say a big welcome to Cheryl Strait. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. So we feel very fortunate to have Cheryl here to, uh, I guess, give us the finale on a year-long series, a think and drink series that Oregon Humanities has put on, on the theme private. So privacy. So William T. Volman, who some of you may know, started the series talking about what it was like to come to face to face with uh, his own FBI file when he was thought to be the Unabomber. Uh, Stephanie Kuntz talked about marriage and the home, and Heidi Bogosian talked about corporate and governmental surveillance, and Cheryl Strait is going to help us think about uh, other ways that uh, privacy shows up in our lives or doesn't. I want to say a quick thanks to a few folks before we get started with the conversation. I want to thank the Oregon Cultural Trust, uh, which has done a lot to make this and many, many other events all around the state possible. Yeah. Also, thank you to Willamette Week and OPB for getting the word out about this, although I have to say that in this particular case, it was not so difficult to get the word out. Uh, and then I want to thank Columbia Bank also for helping put this on. Uh, we're going to talk for 50 or 60 minutes and then open the floor for questions. Cheryl's books are signed copies of her books are for sale out front. Uh, and I think, if it's all right with everyone, we'll just jump in. And the way I think we'll jump in is I just want to ask, I, you just stood over there against the wall and you watched a preview of a movie that's kind of about you, <laughs> written by you, and you watched all these people watching it. And so I just want to ask what that feels like. It's crazy. It's as crazy as, as any of you would imagine. And I don't think I'll ever get over it. You know, every time I see the movie or think about the fact that it's even happened um, and see that trailer, I just think, you know, I just, I'm filled with this sense of you've got to be kidding me. Um, how did this come to pass? It's also, I always, it's um, that little girl that you see in flashes in the trailer, that really blonde girl. That's my daughter. Um, Bobby, who's named after my mother, um, plays me in the film. She plays the young Cheryl. So Reese plays the, the old, or the young old Cheryl. And, <laughs> and uh, Bobby plays the, the young me. And so she played opposite Laura Dern. Laura Dern plays my mom. And so Laura Dern plays Bobby. So Bobby is Cheryl and Laura is Bobby. <laughs> And Reese is Cheryl, and Cheryl is Cheryl. So when we were on the set, it was so confusing because Jean-Marc Vallée, who's the director, he would go, Cheryl, and like everyone would turn, Bobby, and everyone would turn. Um, so it just, it's, a, it's, a, it's astounding, you know? It's, it's an astounding experience. And it made me, uh, when you write a book, what you're asked to do, um, or what you need to ask yourself is, you know, really you have to dig into those memories and dig into those experiences and look at them anew and reevaluate them and, and um, come to know things about those experiences that you never knew before. And what I found is that the film did that same thing. So just on that, on digging back into sort of previous experiences, when I, when I was reading Wild again just before this, there's this funny thing that happens in the book that felt like a kind of <clears throat> precursor for what's now happened on a larger scale, which is people would run into you on the trail and they would say, and you wouldn't have met them before, and they would say, you're Cheryl, uh -huh. because they'd seen your name in the book, not, not the book you wrote, but the book at the beginning of the trail, or they had heard about you from other hikers. I just, uh, were you aware at that time of what that felt like and whether that was a good thing to have people you hadn't met approach you as if they knew you? Yeah. It, on the trail, it was a great thing. It was a wonderful 
way of being in the world, that you actually, the information you got and, and gathered was really by foot. You would meet people and you would say, hey, did you, did you encounter this person named Scott or whatever, you know, or you would read people's entries. Um, there's a scene in the movie that, that uh, is, is altered from the way it is in the book, ex- with one exception. It's when I ma- met the three young bucks, these three young men, and they were immediately um, knew who I not only knew who I was, but had been following me for months and reading my my um, trail register, you know, entries. And so they sort of were like, "We know all about you. We know what books you're reading." It was really cool. Are, is anyone in the room? Anyone I met on the trail? No. So one of the three young bucks, Rick, um, grew up in, in Portland, and um, he I, he was the guy who I wrote about, who I sort of. We, we got a crush on each other, and um, we almost kissed but didn't, and um, we, you know, are still good friends. And I was in San Miguel de Allende in Mexico um, doing an event, and there were like hundreds of people in the room. And when I asked the question, is anyone um, on the trail, you know, anyone here who I knew on the trail, this voice from the back of the room was a woman, and she said, I'm Rick's mom, and he's still single. That's <laughs> true. So, um, he's really cool, if anyone. So he's like, he's like 43 now. He's a professor at UC Davis. I highly recommend him. If you guys, um, anyone want to hook up? He's an avid rock climber and hiker. If you're into the outdoors, so he graduated from Catlin Gable. All right. is, Don't even almost... you know Rick, Rick Chilpinka is his name. Yeah. We should put his Poor fu- Rick, phone he's out there, there like, oh shit, yeah. We could put his number up, maybe. It's the three young bucks who, who uh, they say that they come up with nicknames for everybody yeah. has, an, and, they're, and, they're, and you ask them in the book, what is the name you came up for me? Right. And they say the queen of the PCT. That's right. right? Uh, and that made me, when I came across that in the book, it made me think about names. Uh, because of the earlier discussion in the book where you talk about your own name. Uh, and I wanted to ask you, I guess, about that. In the, at the time, it seemed like when you hiked the PCT, you had just recently changed your last name. You were Cheryl, but your last name became Strayed. Yeah. So I, I guess I just, while we're thinking about these sorts of questions, I wanted to ask about your name and what difference it has made to have other names. Cheryl Strayed, Sugar to some extent, another right. name. Yeah. Oh, we have some sweet peas in the house. Yeah, it's interesting. One of the, I'm really fascinated by this idea of the name change and um, this this theme, you know, private and privacy. One of the first things that happened, um, maybe the first day or two that Wild was out, is the New York Times was about to publish a review, and I got this kind of emergency phone call from my editor. And the New York Times um, was really freaked out and worried about the fact that I had changed my name. And they were, they were kind of interpreting it as if um, I was like trying to escape my past or make secret my past, which I thought was fascinating because I, I you know, I, I had to explain to them, like, well, women change their names all the time when they get married, and nobody thinks they're like joining the, the you know, witness protection program, but, um, <laughs> I was like, all the people who knew me as Cheryl Nyland knew that I changed my name to Cheryl Strait. And if anyone asks me what my last name used to be, I'm happy to tell them what it was. And it, it wasn't a secret. And so I had to tell them, and then they had to make sure that I really was Cheryl, you know, that person I said who I was. And um, so that was, that was interesting to me. And a few times over the course of the past few years, as people have written about Wild. They, they'll ask me about that, like, you, you, know, you wanted to run away from your, your past. And that wasn't it. I really wanted to, st- um, I saw it in a very different way. I wanted to step into my new life. It made sense for me at that moment um, to, to leave behind this name that had been my name. It's my father's name. I don't have a relationship with my father. I don't have a healthy connection with him or memory of him. And so I wanted, and my life was all about... Um, I mean, I think we, what we all need to do at, at a certain point in our lives is to create ourselves, you know, to make ourselves. And because I don't really have that whole family heritage thing, I needed to make myself with language as well. And I did it in the form of a name. Yeah. 
And so, yes, and so, it's, in, I mean, this idea of making yourself, it sounds like what you just said, you're talking about making yourself in the world the way anyone would, no matter what they're doing. Mm -hmm. But then you also make yourself in this very specific way by writing about Cheryl Strait. So you've made a Cheryl Strait, and I could, I could probably in this room and other rooms just say Cheryl, and people would know who I'm referring to. And so you've made that self which is probably not totally identical to you. I think they would think Cheryl Teagues. Remember Cheryl her? Teagues. <laughs> Cheryl Ladd. Cheryl who are, Miller. Who are the other famous Cheryls throughout time? Cheryl Crow. She's awesome. But on that, I guess... We're, we're off track now, aren't we? I'm sorry. No, I messed you up. It's good. I'm and, thinking of Cheryl's. I'm see, this of is why they, they didn't give me any wine even. This is how I am, that. just on water. We're going to work on many Are we going to deliver wine. some wine to the stage? Thank you. Um, Please. I still don't want to let that go. <laughs> even with the wine and the Cheryl in the air, <laughs> the split between you on the page and you as you are world. Uh, is that something that you attend to in conscious ways and think, okay, I'm comfortable crafting the Cheryl Strait that shows up in the book on the page, and I know how that Cheryl Strait is different from you? Right. That's where it's so complicated, um, because really, as a reader, the, the, fic you know, the, the fiction and creative nonfiction that is the most interesting to me um, is those works that really make you feel like you know that character, whether it be a, you know, a real life person or a fictional character, where you, where you not only know them, but that you, that you get to live inside of them, you know, that you inhabit their mind, their body, their spirit in the world. And so I have always been interested in that as a writer. I always try to, I aspire to utter realism, you know, the most the most, I, I always think of it as, and especially in nonfiction, I'm trying to create the, the thinnest possible screen between me and the reader. And so what that demands is, is really um, boldly being as, as truthful as I can be about my experience and my thoughts, um, my flaws, and you know, all of those things that maybe you, you wouldn't speak of or show you know, in, in normal, polite company. Um, and yet, it's also true, there's inevitably, you know, there's a difference between a literary construction and, and who I am. I do, you know, a lot of people come to me and say, how many of you guys think you're my best friend and I just don't know you yet? Um, a lot of people think that, and, and I know that feeling. I know that feeling. I, um, and it, I've had that for other writers. And I also think to some extent, like, when you say you feel like you know me based on what you've read about me, if you've read... Um, you know, Wild and Tiny Beautiful Things and Torch, um, you know, you really do know me, you know some of the deepest parts of me. I mean, I've actually, I actually write from the deepest place within me. Like, I actually do put that on the page. Um, and yet, it's also true that it's different than actually knowing me, you know? Um, as it is, I mean, you know, in person, I'm a person. I'm not a liter literary construction. I don't always speak, you know, in eloquent sentences. And I, I you know, I, I, I disappoint you or I piss you off or I, you know, whatever it is that people do. Um, do any of you know me in real life? Yes, some people. Hi, whoever you are, I can't see you. But, um, but you know, so I think a lot of people, when they meet me, they say, you are just like I thought you would be. And yet, I'm also, you know, there's a difference between being a person and a character on the page. And then, in a way, they already have a perception of who you are, yes. and you don't have that of them. No. <laughs> Well, see, that's the interesting part, is people know, thank you. Look at this, they, they, they filled it to the tippy top here. <laughs> I thought about keeping that for myself. So. That's it, is they're more intimate with me than I am with them, which is why I've often been like, 
you know, in the deli section of New Seasons and I'm hearing somebody's life story. Um, <laughs> because people will just go, oh my God, you don't even know. And then, and I'm getting divorced because like my husband fell in love with like a 22 year old. And then, you know, I mean, and so they're, they're telling me everything. Um, and it's, I roll with it, I get it, because I've told them all of that about myself too, you know? It can be a little awkward, um, I'll admit. I mean, that's, that's serious asymmetry. That's, yeah. I mean, so I, awkward seems like a, a way to describe the moment in New Seasons. But I, I guess I want to ask if it's more than awkward. Yeah, I mean, so I do think that, you know, every, just about everything in life, right, the, you know, the best the, everything has its kind of virtue and its vice. Everything has its light side and its dark side. You know, like my kids, you know, are my greatest love and blessing in the world. And they're also the biggest assholes I know, you know? And, um, <laughs> right, right? I'm teasing. But you, to you, they wouldn't be assholes. They're just assholes to me, you know? Because I'm their mom, you know? Um, it's like their job, you know? Um, but where were we? Okay, so it was... so. Seriously, the thing that matters more to me, way more than the movie, way more than, than you know, hanging out with Oprah or any of the good things that have happened um, because of Wild, um, by far the most important thing that I just, I never, it will never stop being meaningful to me. It's just the people who look me in the eye or send me an email and just say, this book changed my life, what you said, um, made me feel recognized or known or you spoke in a way that you said words I can't say but I feel you know that's a really powerful experience and I love I mean that is the person I want to be in the world you know that is what I want to be as a writer I, I really do believe in the power of art and the power of literature in particular and so, you know, I, I mean, I have all these like political beliefs and ideals and, and long ago I decided that the, the, the best contribution I could make to the world, you know, other than being a good mother and raising good humans, um, is, is to, to, to really do my work as, as a writer. Like I actually think it changes lives, it's changed my life. And so to have people come to me and say um, that I did that to them is, is mind blowing. Um, but, but what I have learned is that I, that that's enough. That I need to say, you know, I can't meet you for tea just because you love my book. And what's sad about that, I mean, we're laughing, but there isn't a day that goes by that I don't receive a really moving and amazing email from somebody who's, you know, all saying, please, you know, I'm coming to Portland, uh, you know, or I live in Portland, and can we please get together? Because I just really want to talk to you because you're the only one who I think will understand. And and I've had to say no. I've had to I've had to learn how to um, just like honor that boundary, um, and just to say, you know, look, I, you know, I gave you like everything I could, and and that's the end. You know, um, right? Does that make sense, or am I crazy? Yeah. <laughs> At the, uh, the sort of, in 2012, I think, when you sort of came out as sugar, <clears throat> you talk about radical sincerity, I think was the phrase you used to describe what you were trying to do with sugar, and I think that applies in the other books and your earlier essays as well, radical sincerity. Uh, and so... Yeah. Well, I just want to say that, so Steve Allman, the writer Steve Allman, he was the one who first coined that phrase. I just want to give him credit okay. that he described that me as, as Sugar doing that. Okay. Um. And I think he was right. I mean, I think that that's, this whole sincerity thing is something I've been doing for, for a long time. Um, and I was nervous about doing it because yeah. I felt like it wasn't cool, you know? So it isn't you, super cool to be sincere. Well, it's, I, uh, people might disagree. I, I, I suspect. <laughs> uh, so how did you? I mean, it, what? So it sounds like it wasn't cool. One concern that maybe you didn't feel like there was not a lot of radical sincerity in the literary world and beyond. But uh, other hesitations about that. About, and I'm asking in part just to keep 
on the same question of people who really, I feel like there's fame in general and then there's the kind of response that people have to you, which is more than just knowing you, knowing of you, it's a sense of real connection. Mm -hmm. uh, adoration and connection. And so I just wanna ask, uh, knowing that, does it still feel like the, the way to be in your writing and in your talking? Or, or have more questions developed for you about that? No, I, I think that, I think it's still the way to be. I, everything good that has come to me in both my life and my work, in my, you know, my personal life and my professional life, has come from being open um, and, you know, taking risks emotionally. You know, asking the question that it seems like maybe one step beyond the question that is polite to ask or saying the thing, you know, I, I really, we were talking earlier in the green room, you know, like I've never been very good at small talk for that reason. When I was a kid, um, I really do think that this goes back to how I became a writer um, because I do, th I do think that the, you know, writers are, are always trying to um, look at the underneath. I mean, the, the thing that, in, that literature does, I think better than any art form and I have respect for them all. I do think that they each, you know, have the thing they do the best. But I think literature does interiority the best. Um, it is the only form that you can absolutely be in the mind of another human, and they can tell you exactly what they're thinking and feeling. And that person can be just like you, or they can be profoundly different. And we've all had that experience, right? It's so fun and interesting and disturbing and powerful and reassuring and all of those things. And I always want to get there with other people. When I was a kid, my mom um, would, would make a rule for me um, when her friends would come visit. And that was, I would, she would like decide how many questions I was allowed to ask them. <laughs> because I would, I would just immediately, you know, if, it, if there were a married couple, you know, I'd look at them and say, so why do you really love each other? And they would be just like, uh, 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 you know, and I, I would be, you know, prying into people's lives. Did you have a good mother? Um, and, you know, like I was like seven, you know, and I was curious. The reason I asked is I was really curious. I was really always struck from a young age uh, between the difference of what, what people wanted others to think they were experiencing and what they were experiencing in any given moment. It's always been a fascinating juncture for me. And so, you know, I, I, I don't, like I just wanna be, I mean, my, my life will continue as it, as it does. Like I, I think that that's just the way to be. That's the way I am. And so I don't, I don't want the success of Wild to, to be something that then causes me to, to close, um, you know, this thing that has really um, you know, given me so much by being open, you know? Yeah. It doesn't make sense to me to shut that down. Yeah. I mean, it was interesting reading Wild now, thinking about privacy and coming. There are certain lines that suddenly take a hold. They look different. And one on this topic is when early in the book you're talking about uh, a number of people, one night stands, two night stands, three night stands, and how you're, you're really... Uh, Three-night handstands. Three-night handstands. <laughs> Those were the wildest ones, yeah. Upside down. That was a good section of the book. And also uh, the graphic novel. That's that right. Um, but you say that there's something about uh, that you're ready to be done with that much intimacy with people that you did not love. <clears throat> Well, because it's anti-intimacy. But your question, you want me to talk about that? I have a story yeah, about that. Yeah, if you want to, sure. <laughs> so I was, I mean, I think, you know, just, I, I, you know, the, the, that writing about this time of my life that I was really promiscuous. And one thing I want to say is, you know, I'm not against promiscuity. I think promiscuity is a highly recommended activity um, <laughs> at various points in your life, you know? Um, it actually, you know, I'm, I'm not kidding. Like, I think it actually can teach you a lot. It can give you a lot. Um, just a good dose of that now and then is probably a good idea. Um, but, <laughs> and certainly, um, I learned a lot from it. But one of the things that I 
did also find is that, you know, I was, what I was doing was really not healthy for me and not good for me and, and destructive. And also it was false power, you know, basically, I mean, I, I like all of women in our culture, you know, as a young woman, it's essentially the most, the biggest power that was granted to me by this culture is my sexual appeal to men, you know? And so the fact that I, you know, chose that route to sort of go down in order to, to fill those holes within me, to feel valid and loved and worthy is no surprise to me. And I was absolutely doing that. Um, and, and I didn't need to keep learning anymore. Um, that I was more powerful than that, that I actually had more interesting ways to feel worthy. And um, so on the trails, when I like really came to terms with that, I came to grips with that. And I, and I came to Portland, I finished my hike 19 years ago on September 15th, 1995. And um, I came to Portland, I had 20 cents, and I lived with a friend of mine on 30th and Belmont in this little house. Um, and I had a yard sale um, because I had no money and so I was, you know, selling just like the, the few things I had in storage and this guy rode up on his bicycle and he and I started flirting and he bought a pencil sharpener from me this, this story does have a point and, um, <laughs> and he's this really super handsome guy named Tom and he asked me to go out to dinner that night he was going out with friends and I said yes, and we went out to dinner at Esparza's on Ankeny and 28th, who, which is now closed down. But Tom's friend at dinner was, was um, Brian, who is my husband now. And it was nine days after I finished hiking the PCT. But we met, and he was really amazing, and I liked him right away. And we, you know, did the thing you do, and you flirted and whatever. And, and so, you know, one thing leads to another, and we're in my room. Um, and... Um, on my bed, and then we had sex, and um, <laughs> and I was like, oh man, that I shouldn't have done that. And the first thing I said to him when we woke up the next morning, I asked him if he regretted what we'd done, and he said no, um, and I knew he was lying, and um, <laughs> and I said that I did, and um, and. We hadn't, you know, it's a longer story than this, but we, we had this kind of experience where we just decided to be friends. And for six, six weeks, we were friends. <laughs> it was a very hot friendship. Um, <laughs> because we didn't touch each other for six weeks. And, and, you know, I thought that when we said we'd be friends, it just meant we wouldn't see each other, but we um, actually would go on walks and talk and, you know. And um, he's the last person I regret having slept with my husband, actually. So, um, it's true. So, so we then did fall in love. I don't remember the question, but, um, you know. You know, what's, you know what's funny about the, is. <clears throat> I oh, would, I know the question okay, now, yes. go, go. Well, let me just, yeah. Go, so go. what I was gonna say is, it was an interesting um, experience in intimacy because, because we were so much more intimate in those six weeks when we were taking walks and talking on the phone and going out to dinner and, you know, that than, than we were when we had sex. And then when we had sex the next time, it was like having sex with a totally different person because we were actually intimate. And it was really interesting that that whole time of my life that I was actually learning about, I mean, it's interesting the way the word intimacy is related to private. You know, that, that, that we do these, we call sex like intimacy, but actually I think we all know that you can be incredible, like it's like anti-intimacy. So that's what I think the promiscuity is, it's anti-intimacy. And it's, it, what I was really meaning to ask in unclear ways about <laughs> was about intimate, you were talking in that moment in the book about intimacy with people who you did not love in terms of promiscuity. Uh -huh. But I, was, I didn't mean to ask about promiscuity, though <laughs> once you started going down that path, I was happy to listen. <laughs> what I wanted to ask about was whether that was kind you know, that in a way I think many of us do feel like we know you intimately. Yet, you can't love us. You don't know us. There are a few people very close. So I was, I was wondering if there were echoes of that 
phrase now to think about. There's a, a, just a huge world out there that feels a kind of intimacy with you. Well, it's interesting because when you said you can't love us, my first thought is, yes, I can. Yeah. You know, I, I think that, I mean, and there are different kinds of love, right? I mean, obviously, um, there's the love we have for people we, you know, know and actually have that, that bond with. But I absolutely, you know, those of you who've read the Dear Sugar column, I've written several times in that column the way that I f feel like the only way I can write a, an answer to a letter is to kind of love the person who wrote me the letter. Mm -hmm. And I really do read the letter and I take it into my heart and I take it into my mind. And I really give the answer truly with love. And I think that's what I mean when I say, um, you know, I really believe that my, my, my work is, is about love. Like I think that my work as a writer is about giving love to the world through language and story. And I, you know, even with Wild, you know, the, people will sometimes ask me why I waited so long to write Wild. And my answer is that I didn't wait. You know, I didn't wait to write, write Wild. I didn't write Wild until I had something to say. And part of that for me, the biggest part of that for me was until I could figure out how to tell the story of my hike um, and my grief and all the things that you know, brought me out to the hike, until I knew that I was telling a story that wasn't just about me. I really wasn't interested in telling, I, I mean, I don't think that my life is inherently more interesting than any one of your lives. And so, and I do think that memoir really is about um, using the self as a conduit um, for universal truth, just just like the novel, like just like fictional characters are. So, until I was telling a, a story that exceeded the bounds of my own problems and my own triumphs and my own interesting um, anecdotes, I didn't have a book on my hands. And so, in order, you know, you you kind of have to, you do kind of have to love people. You kind you kind of have to love this anonymous readership that you imagine when you're alone in your room in order to write, I think, with that kind of human truth. You know, so I actually really hold, um, you know, in sugar it's very specific. Somebody's actually said, you know, I've got this problem. And I really hold that person in my heart. But, but, but with my other work, there is a sense of love. I, I strongly agree that there's a, it comes off the page that, and so I was, I've been trying to think, and I saw you speak and bend to about, 800 people several months ago and I saw everyone in that room feel love for you while you were reading and answering questions after and since then I've been trying to, as I've been reading things, I've been trying to think, how does this happen? How does this magical thing happen? It does not happen with most writers and so as I've been rereading, thinking about this conversation tonight, one of the things that seems to me to be happening on the page and it happens in person too but is... Uh, what seems to me to be the other side of love, which is loss. Mm -hmm. So related to this idea of radical sincerity, I think a couple people have, I think when they've, they heard that you were gonna talk about privacy here, they immediately thought of things like promiscuity. But I don't think- In my that, vagina, yeah. That may be. <laughs> I, I can't vouch for that, I don't know. I, do <laughs> I just like to use that word as often as possible. I'm gonna, uh, I would say... <laughs> He's going to drink to that. <laughs> um, and I'm going to... I will support that but not repeat it right now. Um, he but can't, you can't even say the word, can you? I can. I can. Because, I say he, it all the time. I said it many times in the green room before you got here. <laughs> what I did want to say... He won't say it. He won't I, say I will it. happily... <laughs> in English, vagina? How's that? Oh, thank you. Thank All you. All right. Woo. Nobody else has pushed me in that direction just yet. I know. Yet. I, like, I like to sort of push people outside the yeah, comfort zone. That's good. Yeah. It's only fair, I think. <laughs> I'm going to try to go back to loss now. We won't now. mention the word clitoris. <laughs> that it seemed to me. <laughs> <laughs> and this is true of the early essays in The Sun and the essays that seemed to prepare the way for a while that... Uh,
It's good. These things are mixed up, right? They are mixed up. <laughs> but to be able to write really about pain and loss, to go fully into that, that feels to me like the most intimate part of what you write and also the most taxing part, the most demanding. Uh, it feels to me like that, when you say you are trying, that, that love is what you're after as a writer, I feel that. And the other side of that seems to be the loss of those you have loved and the potential loss of those you love. And so that feels very intense. Mm -hmm. And I guess I just want to ask about how it is to write about loss in such a way that you're there, fully in it. Yeah, no, I think that's really true. And, you know, I think whenever people, um, you know, a lot of times when, when people write about sex, They'll, they'll say, people will say that writer is really brave or really risky. And I always think, it, I don't think it's really very taboo anymore to write about sex. I think um, what I have come up against kind of interestingly is that it, it, it's much more risky to write the whole truth about who you are and how you feel and how you've suffered um, in your life. And one of the things that I felt very nervous about and self-conscious of um, always, you know, always in my writing, but especially when I was writing Wild, is I was afraid people would say, um, you know, oh, just, you know, get over it. Like, why are you, why do you, you know, why are you so upset about your mom dying? People die. Um, and I think some people probably do say that, uh, but, but many more what, I mean, th that's, that's the thing that people that causes people to come to me and look me in the eyes and cry and say, I know the sorrow you wrote about and you are the first person who ever put to words what my feelings were. And it, it really has told me, I mean, the, the, the power of this, just this thing, this, the silent grief of so many of us is enormous. And I feel like through, through my work, as you said, the early essays that I've written about grief, but then because Wild has had such a, a worldwide stage, I've had access to literally millions of people uh, from cultures all over the world. And they all say the same thing to me about Wild. They all say the same thing to me about grief. And it's always that they thought that they were alone. And I think it's interesting. I think it tells us something about, you know, the territory that we haven't yet um, managed to cover when it comes to, you know, how is it that we, we're all going to suffer in this way someday, or most of us. I mean, it's interesting. My mom, she died when she was 45. And one of the things that infuriated me or made me feel sort of betrayed by my mother is that she had never suffered a great loss. And it was the only thing that, that, um, that I had to do that my mother never had to do, you know, at that point in my life when, when she died. Everything had been always, you know, from the moment we're born, right, we, 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 we imitate our parents to figure out who we are in the world. And suddenly my mom died, and I was like, you got away with this. You, you died, and you never had to go through this kind of grief. But I knew that I was a sort of savage. I knew that I loved my mom too much. I knew I was too sad about her death. And I also knew that I had to write the truth about it. And even if I was going to be kind of laughed at and condemned for it. And what, what was interesting is it was the opposite experience, is that this entire gigantic worldwide tribe like gathered around me and said, thank you. Uh, I mean, that sort of, that picture of a tribe of people who have also lost loved ones gathering around uh, sounds like it answers the question about what it requires from you to live, to relive and keep fresh that feeling of loss. I guess I want to ask that though, and just, I mean, as you write about that, as you keep, so I, I have lost close people at young ages and I feel like on one hand, it's, very, it's difficult to stay there with it and feel it. On the other hand, it keeps that person more alive. It keeps them from becoming extinct mm -hmm. in some way. Uh, 
I don't have the experience of having, you know, what you've done is to communicate this in a way that people, as you say, gather around. And I guess, do you feel like on the whole that, that uh, mitigates that sense of loss and sense of pain or does it stand next to it? How, how do those go together, the sense of having that community and being so fresh still with the sense of loss? Hmm. Well, you know, I don't know. I don't think it's, it doesn't feel fresh. It feels actually aged. And that doesn't mean that I don't know the depth and the width and the, you know, how profound that loss is. But, you know, it, it is definitely, you know, gosh, like 23 or 24 years have passed since my mom died. And, um, you know, you know different things. I mean, as you get older, you know different things about your life. And one of the things I know more about now is, is, is that grief process. I, do, I will say... Um, that it does feel useful. It feels like I'm turning, I, I've always been really moved by that, that image of the, you know, that story of the phoenix rising from the ashes. And one of the things I knew for sure when my mom died is that I, it was so ugly that I, that I had to make something beautiful of it, that that was the thing I absolutely had to do. And for a while, I failed to do that. I, in my grief, you know, I made myself ugly. I made myself somebody who was not, I mean, who was the ash. And, you know, that, that moment when I realized that I, it wasn't a moment, it was kind of an era of my life where I realized I had to change. You know, it doesn't, I mean, I think one of the things in Wild I wanted to write about the way transformation happens, I think we're so trained about this idea of the epiphany. And I do think I've had epiphanies in my life, but usually it's like more like a, like a few weeks or a month that you're realizing this is not working, this is not okay. And for me, what it was is that, you know, I, I think in retrospect that my grieving my mom the way I did, you know, actually here in Portland, coming to Portland and you know, using heroin and, and, and really just my life very much going on the skids here. Um, I thought in some demented way I was honoring my mom um, because I was really showing the world, like, she's so important, I'm just going to show you. I'm not going to, I'm just going to rage against this. And then when I saw that the only person I was ruining was myself, um, you know, I just couldn't bear it. My mom had loved me too well. She... And that love lived in me. And that was the thing that would never die, is, is how well she loved me. I think once you've been loved that well, you, it's just like, there it is. It's, it's part of you. It's every cell. It's every cell in your body. And so my mother wrecked me, and then my mother saved me. You know, she gave me the tools I needed to save myself because she loved me so well. She was such a good mom. And which, which is to say not a perfect mom. So any of you sitting out there going, oh, shit. Um, <laughs> Right? Wasn't a perfect mom, but I always knew, you know, when, there's a line in the movie that matters a lot to me, and Reese says, it's actually uh, right after, in the trailer, that therapist says to her, you're having sex with everyone, you're doing heroin, and, um, and he says to her, you know, she, he asks her about whether she thinks she matters, and she looks at him and she says, says adamantly, I know that I matter. And I knew that I mattered. I didn't feel I mattered, but I knew, like I, I had grown up with the consciousness that, that I was a sacred being and that we all are. And so I had to honor my mom. You know, I had to be that, that phoenix that rises from the ashes in order, you know, not to have my own glorious life, but really to have, to, to become the person my mother raised me to be. And so I think about this, um, you know, when it comes to, grief too and like the, that actually the other side of grief i love that you said earlier this idea that that you know um love is loss and and i often think of it as the other way that that grief like when you actually really grieve somebody um i think that the the the, the, the word the, the the feeling we have about that is we think of sorrow we think about depression we think about um a kind of being incapacitated with, you know, tears or whatever it is. But what I think, you know, what's on the other end of that 
um, if you go down, if you, you know, allow yourself to go on that whole journey, is, it's love. Like, the only way you can possibly actually grieve someone that deeply is if you love them truly. And what a rare and beautiful thing it is to love someone truly. And I will never, I mean, I never get over, my mom's been dead longer than she was alive in my life. And you know, I'm about like five words away from just like bawling right now. <laughs> I mean, that's how palpable she is to me. It's how much I still love her. It's, a, it's, it's the astonishment of my life. How long um, love can last. My daughter, she turned nine yesterday, but last year she was eight when she played me. And for the electronic press kit for the movie, they interviewed her about like what the movie's about. And you know, she's, she was eight, she had just turned eight. And so she's not such a great interview, um, you know. <laughs> um, but she said the most amazing thing. She's, um, she was asked, what's, what's wild about? What's your mommy's book about? And she said, it's about hiking and it's about how long you can love someone. So there we go. While you were talking about your mother, I had started to think about what you said earlier about your daughter being in the movie. Um, and so then you went towards your daughter your, yourself. But I wanted to ask if you had hesitations at all. In a way, you've been able to choose uh, to publish books and to, uh, books about you. <clears throat> And I wonder, did you think at all, well, maybe I don't want to have my daughter on screen or... So it's really a question about uh, exposure, not just right. your own, but the people close to you. Yeah, absolutely. My husband and I talked a lot about it. Well, first of all, we, you know, for her to be in the movie, I'm really open with my kids. Um, th they're, you know, obviously big parts of the story that they're not yet quite aware of, um, <laughs> thank God, um, and, but, but, you know, they always knew, you know, from the beginning, I told them about my father, you know, because kids are so curious, well, who's, you know, why don't we have a grandfather? They always had heard about my mother, and, um, you know, I told them about, um, him being so abusive. One of the most amazing, I think I wrote a sugar column about it that's not, in the book, I think it's just online. I think it's called Monsters and Ghosts. And um, in it, I tell the story of how um, one time I got just really impatient with my kids and I yelled at them. I said, you know how lucky you are? Um, if I, you know, when I was your age, my dad would have beat me with a belt. And they looked at me in shock and I immediately, you know, regretted what I'd said in anger and, and um, they looked at me and then a beat passed and then they started laughing. And I really, and, and I was like, <laughs> and they said, they, they thought I was joking. Hmm. And you know, they, they thought, um, they said, grownups don't do that. And I thought it was so interesting that my kids were under the impression that, um, that grown-ups were incapable of harming them because I was not under that impression at their age or ever. And, um, you know, I think that, so, so I talked to them about it, you know, all the, through my life, I've talked to my kids, or all through their lives, I've talked to the, my kids about, like, what my childhood was like, what my father was like, what my mother was like. And so th those were the only really hard scenes in the movie for, um, to watch my daughter be, you know, the, the man who plays... Um, my father, who's a wonderful actor here in, in Portland, um, and he repeatedly, you know, holds his fist up to my daughter's face and says, you want a knuckle sandwich? And he, you know, beats up um, the mom and chases them out of the house and is like screaming horrible things at them. And so we were shooting the, the, that scene in this farmhouse outside of Canby. And, um, you know, we were like, every time the director would say cut, my husband and I were like, Bobby, you know, this is just a joke and it's just pretend. And, and the actor was like, I'm, I'm, I'm really a nice guy. I would never do that. And she was like, would you guys leave me the fuck alone? I mean, 
I mean, she didn't say fuck. She's not allowed to say fuck. But she was like, will you guys, but she had that attitude. Will you guys leave me? Like, I know it's just acting, you know? And, and that was really interesting. Like, so, you know, she was totally okay with that. It was more traumatic for me, actually, because she was fine, but I was remembering, like, my own childhood, you know? Yeah. And but, but, you know, we will say, like, she, her role is really small. As she says, she's a memory. So she comes on screen whenever Reese is remembering her childhood. So she doesn't have like lines or she just, you just see her in flashes. And so she didn't have to do terribly um, extended, terrible, you know, hard things. But that, what she says, leave me alone, that's yeah. a abridged version of what you hear her saying there. Um, yeah. I guess it's the last question I want to ask before opening, opening the floor up for questions. And that is, so much of what seems to happen in Wild, and by that I mean inside you, seems to be related to your being alone uh, for great stretches of time. And so I just want to ask, as, as Wild has blown up, and as your Facebook page, and if, how many Twitter followers, and, like, is it possible for you now to be alone in the way that during the experience you wrote about, you were? Mm, I think our whole culture has, you know, made a very big leap when it comes to solitude, um, you know, since 1995 when I, when I hiked the trail. I think it's much, much more difficult to be alone than it used to be. I mean, even just so recently, you know, um, I, most of us carry around in our pockets, you know, a portal into the whole world in a way that we never used to. And I learned the existence of, I heard the, I first heard the phrase cell phone when I was on the Pacific Crest Trail. Um, this guy, Albert, I write about having met in, at Kennedy Meadows and he helped lighten my pack. One of the things I didn't write in Wild is that he was this ultralight backpacker, but he had this thing in his pack that was a plastic brick with numbers on the front. And I said, well, what is that thing? And he said, it's something called a cell phone. And he had been asked by a company that was developing a cell phone to, to carry it on the trail and turn it on like once a day or once an hour or something to see if it ever got reception. And he said, at Kennedy Meadows, he'd been hiking with it for like six weeks. He said, it's never gotten any reception. So he was gonna leave it in the PCT hiker free box. <laughs> and I do remember they were like, so, so the, the guy I call Greg in the book, um, he's, his real name is Roger. He lives in Portland. Any of you know Roger Carpenter? Anyway, he's, I just had dinner with him a couple of weeks ago. He's, he lives in Portland. And, um, he, and he and I and, you know, all the people who were there, you know, we, I distinctly remember us all having this conversation that we said, well, that is a product that is totally going to fail. Um, <laughs> So this is why you guys know I'm a writer instead of in product development. Um, because who in their right mind would agree to carry their telephone around with them, right? I mean, why would you always want to be able to have someone contact you? Like that, in 1995, all of us, there was con a consensus that that seemed like a very bad idea. Do you guys remember this? Do you remember this time? Do you remember when you thought, no way? But now, we, most of us, I mean, probably, I mean, I'd be surprised, is there anyone in the room who doesn't have a cell phone? One person. Okay, a couple people. But you are annoying, because we want to be able to reach you. Right? Like, I have one friend who doesn't have email, and I'm always like, well, fuck her. She's not going to be invited to the party then, you know? Because it's like, it's too hard to get in touch with people. I mean, what are we supposed to do, send a pony? I mean... But no, I, so I think you're right. Like, I agree with you. Like, that's the life I want again. And yet life moves on and we have this technology. It's very complicated. So, so this solitude, um, you know, I, I finished Wild. Um, I was trying to, you know, I, I, it was like 2009 when I sold Wild based on the first like 130 pages. And I said I would hand it in on February 1st, 2010. And so I, and I really set about doing it. I took that deadline seriously. And I was invited, I have this wonderful friend named Jane O'Keefe, 
who um, lives in um, Lake County, Oregon. Do you all know where Lake County is? It's way far away. It's beautiful. Um, and, there, and she had a friend. Um, they all have cattle ranches down there. They're, they're, they're basically the Republican wives of Oregon. Took me, true story, took me under their wing. Um, and I was, um, the Fitzgerald farm, the, this ranch, they, they invited me to this little house um, just out in the middle of nowhere near the town of Plush across the road from the Hart Mountain um, Antelope Refuge. And they gave me this house for about three weeks and I went there and, I, and I, that's where I finished Wild. And I um, you know, wrote the last chapter and like read the entire book out loud to myself and, and made sure it was all right before I sent it off to my editor. And um, there was, it was so remote. There was no internet connection, no cell service. Um, there was no even lock on the, d the door because there would be nobody who came, except, except with the exception of every morning I'd wake up and you know, there were no curtains on this little cabin I was in because it was just like so in the middle of nowhere. But I would wake up and I would, it would be like I was still dreaming because these cowboys with chaps on would come riding up on the horses. Um, and they were like, you know, um, doing their thing with the cows and, um, or the cattle or whatever it is. But anyway, um, I was like, finally, all of my fantasies have come true. Um, <laughs> hey, cowboy, I need a cup of coffee. You know, so I, anyway, I was riding wild and, and it was so alone. And I remembered the world without the internet connection and without the cell connection. And I would, and I grew up that way. I grew up without electricity or a phone or running water or indoor plumbing in Northern Minnesota. And I would have to get in my car and drive to Plush, which was 10 miles away and use a payphone to call my husband and kids. And, and you know, it was inconvenient and it was a pain in the ass, but I was alone. And every time I've ever finished a book, all three of my books, I had to do that where I was kind of cut off and I think that something happens. Like, I think something happens to the mind. I think that something really important on my hike happened with, with just myself, like the way I felt about myself, that had to do with actually being not in contact with anyone else. And, you know, if I, need, if I needed to talk to somebody else, it would be like a days and days hike away oftentimes. And so it was profound, you know. I had to listen to my own thoughts. I had to grapple with the discomfort, and it is uncomfortable to be alone. Um, and I don't do it enough in my life now. And it, I don't think it's because of the success of Wild. I think it's because of the world we live in. I'm just like everyone else. I'm always checking my phone. The last thing I did before I walked on stage is check my phone. And it's probably the first thing I'm going to do when I walk off. And I don't like it. I want to change that. And yet, we're, how do we go back? You know, I guess we don't. Chaps. Chaps. <laughs> That's how we go back. That's, I, uh, I mean, a question about solitude, the answer to which includes chaps, is, is a good answer, I think. <clears throat> Have you ever seen a real cow? Here is a thing that I was so amazed by in Lake County. And just, just to get, so there's Rick Topinka, he's available. Um, also, the Cowboys of Lake County. You guys, first of all, get the terminology right. They're not, they don't, they call themselves buckaroos. And what was so amazing to me is they actually look like cowboys. I mean, they, they're not, they dress, you know, like in the dusters and the hats and the chaps. It's awesome. So what I'd like to do is shift us to questions <laughs> uh, and maybe say thanks as we shift. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so there is a microphone, a standing mic over here, and I want to say one other thing uh, while people are lining up to ask questions, and that is that Cumbersome Multiples is combining sort of pre-cell phone and post-cell phone technology over there uh, with prints, which they are then tweeting of really of Is the that you, Tracy? Hi. <laughs> I know cumbersome multiples, it turns out. Sorry, I didn't know. That's good. I hope everyone does. And it sounds like Tracy and Dan have generously offered that people that make donations tonight will be eligible to win prints of some of the tweets that they're printing. Uh, so you should check those out. And I think it's, a, if I have it straight, and I hope someone will wave at me if I don't, I think 
donation to Oregon Humanities of, uh, I think it's a 50 bucks or more, makes, gets you eligible to win a print, and you could simply hand those to ushers on the way out. Nobody's waving at me. Somebody's waving something, but I can't see what, so I'm not going to say what it is. What I am going to say is, uh, please, let's, let's try to get as many questions as we can. In, I won't and if be maybe so, I'm, I, I'm sort of don't give short answers. Did you guys notice that? I'm sorry. I'll be quick. I'll so try to. We grew up in a place where people weren't supposed to talk about their feelings, and we were supposed to not talk about ourselves. So how did you get over that northern Minnesota. Is that Charles? It is Charles. Hi! <laughs> I can't see anyone, but I, yeah. How do I get over that? Yeah. You know, I think in some ways, I'm lucky in that I, I literally, I, I do think, I, I, I always did have a kind of inappropriate personality. And um, I mean, I'm not kidding you when I say that when I was a little kid, I would ask people questions and I would also say things um, beyond what was perhaps, you know, like I would take risks in that way. I wasn't ever a risk taker like, you know, the, the bravest, you know, tree climber or the skateboarder or whatever, but I was always an emotional risk taker, always. And, you know, I think that for people who struggle, you know, I, I certainly teach writing um, sometimes and that's always the question, you know, when you write about yourself, like oh, how, you know, it's so, un it's so scary to, to tell the truth. But the thing I always encourage people to take solace in is that, you know, I think what we're always afraid of is condemnation and judgment. That if you say the, you know, something, that, that, something sort of that we perceive as kind of negative or unflattering about yourself, that people won't like you and that they will condemn you. And I, I always reassure people, you would be shocked at how few people write to me and say nasty things to me. How few people. Um, I do, of course, get really, I mean, you could read very nasty things about me, I'm sure, on my, like, my, just click on the one stars on Amazon and whatever. I don't click on that. But, um, but you know, more, the, the main message has been, thank you for telling the truth, not you're a stupid bitch, you know? And, um, and so I will say when we do risk the truth, most people will, will trust, they'll, 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 they'll like us for it. So I say, just be brave. That's the deal too. It's like you only live once. I mean, are you going to just sit around and hide behind the curtains your whole life? You know. So um, I really do just say, try. Okay, even if you're from Minnesota. <laughs> Hi. Hey, Cheryl. Um, I wanted to thank you, oh, thank um, you for being sugar, and I want to thank you for tiny beautiful things. Thank you. And in, in terms of your theme about making a connection, you have a, a letter that's in uh, tiny beautiful things called the Ecstatic Parade um, about a, a gay a gay male, young gay youth, yeah, who um, who didn't have accepting parents, and you told him to save his life and get out of there. And I just want you to know that I xerox that article and I give it to at risk middle schoolers and teens, and they are moved by it because the news that there are people out there who are making a ladder that they can climb to a happy life, and so thank you. That ladder is your words, and um, I just wanted to give you a gift. I don't have a question. I just want to say thanks. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. That, that letter means so much to me. And I write about um, the parade, that ecstatic parade that I write about is here in Portland that I've attended every year with my kids. And it, it, it really is, um, you know, it's just the truth. So thank you. <laughs> hi, Cheryl. I'm Quinn. Hi. Um, hi. And uh, you talk a lot about the courage it takes to speak your own truth about your own experiences in your life. And um, I aspire to write my own story, but what scares me the most is writing about other people's truth or my experience of them um, and how that's truthful to me and how that might impact them when they read it. And I'm wondering how you've gotten past that or how that's come up for you in your writing. Yeah, I don't think it's anything you ever get past. It is the hardest thing about writing about your life because I do feel like you need to be merciless with yourself and you need to, to be as transparent as possible and honest as possible. 
but, but you, that you don't have a right to do that with other people. You know, that other people's lives are their own and they have a right to them. And yet it's complicated, right? Because your life crosses over with theirs. And so what I do, I mean, there's no one answer. I'm as careful as I can be with everyone I write about. Um, sometimes I decide not to write fully about people. Like, you know, one of the questions I get a lot about Wild is like, are your siblings okay? Or and people want to know about my siblings. And, you know, my brother's more in the book than my sister. But, you know, they have huge whole stories that I've chosen not to write about because I don't feel like I have the right to. They have big, complex lives. And I didn't want to invade their privacy. I didn't want to hurt their feelings. Um, other people, like my father, you know, I really searched my soul. I, I needed to, I had the right to tell the world about who my father was to me. And I knew that I needed to do it from a place of forgiveness, total forgiveness, total, absolute. Um, every word I write about my father, even though they're very unflattering words, I honestly write with no anger. And I had to, you know, years had to pass before that was true. Um, I, I value my father as one of my greatest teachers. Um, a dark teacher, but a great teacher. And so I think until you get to that place of, you know, really being able to be very clear about the reasons you're telling your story, I think the kids have the right to tell people about their parents. I think it's the reason that my children will be banned for, you know, they won't write memoirs. Um, but I do, I, I think that the kids, I think that you do have the right to tell this, your story about your parents. And the other thing is I always remind people about memoir is it's the art of subjectivity, it's subjective truth. That doesn't mean that the memoirist doesn't have obligations to the objective truth. Like I absolutely was very rigorous about that. But I always remind people like this portrait of each, each portrait is the portrait through my perspective. Um, my father's next door neighbor might give you a different portrait of him than I would. Um, and I, I fully acknowledge that. And so take these truths into your mind and um, grapple with them. It's, never, it's a never ending process of, of really interrogation. Uh, and I never, I mean, never write from, from re a position of revenge ever, ever. Good luck. <laughs> Hi. Hi, my name's Kate. Um, I loved all of Wild. I think some of my favorite parts were the parts where you are trying to put on your backpack for the first time. Um, and also the parts where you start getting blisters. Um, largely, Thank you. Largely. <laughs> my <laughs> pain is your joy. <laughs> well, that's, that's actually what I wanted to ask about. I mean, partly because I've had those experiences and it was very humorous yeah. to me. Um, also because I feel like they were actually important moments to the sort of emotional side of the story as well. And um, I wonder if I can say this without sounding like a masochist, but I wonder what you have to say about the relationship between physical pain and emotional pain in your story. Yeah, I think, I think physical pain is um, such a restorative thing sometimes. I mean, I was emotionally suffering and I went on the trail and I got myself in a situation where I was physically suffering. And it took my mind off the emotional suffering. And moving through it taught me what I needed to do emotionally. You know, literally every step hurt. You know, for me to write that line, um, literally every step hurt and wild, um, what I'm really speaking to is, is that, that, you know, every step might hurt emotionally. Like every day without my mom, oh, that's a day without my mom. And that idea seemed unbearable to me before my hike. And then it, it seemed like something I could do. Um, and, I, you know, I think it's no coincidence that, that this was a transformative experience to me, speaks to the ancient wisdom, you know, throughout time, across cultures, the human experience has done this thing that we've, for whatever reason, abandoned, where we give young people the opportunity to have a rite of passage. They always have three things in common, solitude, deprivation, physical suffering. And 
you know, we send people out alone into the wilderness and they have to find their way. And, and I think that, um, I mean, or we don't, I mean, I think that, you know, throughout, throughout time, tribal cultures have done this. And I realized when I was writing Wild that I just created that for myself, right? And so I do think we should listen to that ancient wisdom. I mean, really, and not just in youth, but maybe, I'm sorry, you know, middle-aged people, you're going to also have to do this, you know? I mean, <laughs> like, the, the, those, you know, those passages we have, right, when we move from one era to the next. Um, they teach us, again who we are, they allow us to know our own strength and our own limitations. And I think those are really valuable things. Thank Thanks. you. <laughs> Hi. Hi, I'm Harvey. Thank you, Cheryl. This has been an extraordinary experience. Thank you. And I have a little confession to make. Um, Uh-oh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I, I only read the first half of your book. And, uh, uh, and there was a real s serious reason for that. My son went out on the, on the trail, Mexico to Canada, left a year and a half ago, got there a year ago. And it terrified me, reading your book. Really? To think about him being out there, you know, like when your boot falls down the mountain, <laughs> and, and when you don't have enough water. Mm -hmm. And there was a time when he wrote to me, after the fact and said, oh yeah, we had a real stretch where it was hotter, drier, right. more desert. I said, he could have had a heat stroke, he might have never come home. And so reading the book uh, as he was hiking it was, you know, just a little bit more than I could handle right then. But now that I've met you more personally, I'm looking forward to reading the other half of the book. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank so, you. Thank you. And also my son Grady said it was the best year of his life. I know, yeah. And and but it's kind of addictive. I think he's planning to do the the Continental Divide Trail. Yeah, next. of course he is. Yeah. Bigger, <laughs> longer, more scary. Okay. You know, it's it's interesting. You're the first person who's ever said that to me. I I talk to a lot of parents of PCT hikers, and usually they say, "Oh, it was so reassuring. It gave me a deeper understanding of what they were out up to out there." But I understand one thing, though. I want to say is it's fascinating to me this idea of like what we consider risk. Like people are always gonna be like, you, you could have died out there, you know? And we never say when we get in the car and like drive across town, oh my God, you could have died. Even though statistically speaking, you could have died. There was a much greater chance of you t having to ha die. And I always think it's funny, it's like I write this book where I'm like, yeah, I was like shooting heroin and sleeping with everyone. And people then are like, and then you went hiking, oh my God. <laughs> I mean, really. <laughs> Absolutely. So right. this is a long way of saying, keep everything in perspective, okay? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Are you there, Cheryl? I'm Mike Hi. Salmon from Minnesota. You're from Minnesota? Oh, yeah. You're Where in Minnesota are you from? Stillwater. Very good. You've got a fan base over yeah, there. Yeah, go Vikes. <laughs> um, so I just saw one of the sill screens. Can I just look at it? It's just really drawn. What? What's this? What, I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, what is that? Our silent grief is enormous, and it was really moving for me because um, what I'm. Oh wait, did I say that? Yeah. Is that what? The, that's yeah. Yeah. Oh, that is so one. cool. Those that's are the things one. I said. Yeah. That's, that's is vagina one. in there? Oh. oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, said that. I hope so. <laughs> what? My question has nothing to do with vaginas, but um, damn. Sorry. Uh, as as someone who who's uh, I've, I've been asked or told to begin writing to myself, and uh, there's just a block, and I'm and I'm like, where? Because any writing that I usually have done has has been to someone, and um, I, I guess I could use a little advice of uh, how, where could one start when writing to oneself? Okay, so 
Tonight, when you go home, or tomorrow morning when you wake up, I your choice. I know your answer is just fucking do it. And, and it's start, just fucking do it, but I, no, I'm going to, you asked, I'm going to give you an assignment. Okay. Yes. Okay, I'm a teacher too, so I need that kind of stuff. All right, ready? <laughs> okay, I want you to write a five-page scene, not more, not less, where you write about what happened the last time you cried. Okay? okay. Begin there. Okay. Good luck. Easy. Thank you. <laughs> Hi. That's, I'm just going to interrupt for a sec. I think that's the equivalent of the music starting to play at the Oscars. Okay. So we should probably these last two There's questions. There's two more people. We can exactly. answer them. Exactly. Mine's quick. Um, it's kind of in a different vein than a lot of people's. Um, but I know for me, Tiny Beautiful Things is one of those books that I turn to when I am having a hard time or need to like get in touch with a deeper part of myself. And it's a book that I give to people um, when... I don't know, it's just a book I universally want everyone to read. And whenever I know someone who's going through something, I always am like, read this, please. Um, and I was wondering, in your life, what are books that have served that role for you? Mm. So many books. That's always a hard question to answer. But I will say, um, Alice Munro is my favorite writer. She's an incredible fiction writer who I have turned to over and over again. Her stories always remind me of everything. You know, the whole, the wholeness of humanity. Um, I love her so much. And so I turn to her a lot. Thank you so much for turning to my book. Yeah, that means absolutely. so much Thank to me. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Uh, so you wrote the essay, The Future Has an Ancient Heart. And it was to my class um, at the University of Alabama. So. Oh, cool. Hi, I'm Team Cupcake in 408. Oh, yay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, my question is, um, when you were writing Dear Sugar, um, what are some of the hardest things, like, say, it's like something like that is kind of, it's an easier audience to write to because it's somebody, it's a group that's younger than you. What is some of your hesitancies towards writing people that you feel like you aren't connected to really at all in, in a way that d doesn't sound condescending, I guess? Yeah, the, so the, the advice, the letters that were always hard for me to answer, um, th there's a whole slew of letters I got from women who just found out they were pregnant and they didn't want to be pregnant. And they had all different situations. Some were married and they didn't want to tell their husband um, because their husband would not want, to, want her to have an abortion. Others were like single and had no money and didn't know what to do. And like that always felt like it was such a specific question that there, I, I had no right whatsoever to ever tell anyone what to do in that regard. So those questions I would usually end up writing, specific, like just emailing the person and offering whatever counsel I could and support without making a public pronouncement. Because as you know, those Dear Sugar letters, they, you know, I do give actual advice, but they're more universal, you know? And something like, should I keep this baby or not, you know, is like so specific that I, I had those, those hard times being very, you know, the, the letters that were like, I need an answer to this question now, and it's either yes or no. I was like, I backed off from those. I was more interested in sugar, when writing the sugar column, in, in those kind of bigger universal conundrums and quandaries. And, and sometimes on the face of it, they looked like specific, like, you know, my wife cheated on me, should, should, should we try to work it out or not? That looks like a specific question, but I was able to make it bigger. Um, but but that, that pregnancy one, um, I, never, I never could get my hands around. There were, some, there were some points where you spoke really bluntly to your audience. Like, were you ever, once you sent a request or once you sent a response, were you ever like, oh, shit, like, I probably shouldn't have said that? No, I don't regret any of my answers, um, though it is interesting. Um, there's this one um, called We Are All Savages Inside that, that was this young woman who was really pissed. She, she's a writer, and she was really mad that she hadn't yet received her six-figure book deal. And um, she explained that she had a right to this because she had been educated in the Ivy League. And um, I was very direct with her. Um, 
but what was so funny to me is that, that was that's interesting about this sincerity thing. I think that we're so used to sarcasm and snark that actually, like, I actually really, the reason I was so direct with her is because I really cared about her. Like, I really did want the best for her. I really did love her. And so the letter culminates where I say, you know, I tell her, you know, all of these things that are wrong with what she just said to me. But then, but then I also say, you know, I, I, write to me when you sell your book because I will be over the moon for you. I, I use that, I say I'll be over the moon for you. And I saw that some readers were like, you know, mash, sugar's being, and they thought I was being like sarcastic. And, and I was actually being um, truthful. I mean, I was being sincere, so. But, uh, so no, I don't regret any, and so many amazing things. I've met babies um, that were born because of sugar columns. <laughs> Isn't that? Um, weird that, uh, that, that those of you who haven't read the book, there's like, you know, there are columns where like women are like, I don't have a guy, you know, um, I want to have a baby. And I was like, so I wrote this column called There's No Mystery About the Sperm and talking about like, you know, hey, you, you could have a baby without the dude. And, um, and so some people did and um, they have babies now. So. <laughs> thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. So before saying one more large thanks to Cheryl, uh, I just want to, I guess, make sure folks know that Oregon Humanities runs events like this and other ways of trying to convene people around the state uh, for conversation. And if you want to learn more about that, I hope you will grab our materials or sign up for our e-news and uh, show up to our next Think and Drink. Barry Lopez will be kicking off next year. Uh, in when just is a few Barry months. Lopez coming? We are just finalizing a date. It'll be either end of January or early February. I love him. I'm going to come. Thank you. I think we just sold the place out. That's great. Um, I have an odd piece of news, which is we, we actually have to kind of vacate the building a little bit. There's something else going on in here after this. So I want to say both thank you. It's a burlesque show. It, before we go, can we just say one more time for sincerity, presence, humor, and everything else, a big thank you to Cheryl Street. Oh, thank you.